Chapter 16 As no objection was made to the young people's engagement with their aunt, and all Mr. Collins's scruples of leaving Mr. and Mrs. Bennett for a single evening during his visit were most readily resisted, the coach conveyed him and his five cousins at a suitable hour to Meryton, and the girls had the pleasure of hearing, as they entered the drawing room, that Mr. Wickham had accepted their uncle's invitation and was then in the house. When this information was given, and they had all taken their seats, Mr. Collins was at leisure to look around him and admire, and he was so much struck with the size and furniture of the apartment that he declared he might almost have supposed himself in the small summer breakfast parlor at Rosen's, a comparison that did not at first convey much gratification. But when Mrs. Phillips understood from him what Rosen's was, and who was its proprietor, when she had listened to the description of only one of Lady Catherine's drawing rooms and found that the chimney piece alone had cost 800 pounds, she felt all the force of the compliment and would hardly have resented a comparison with the housekeeper's room. In describing to her all the grandeur of Lady Catherine and her mansion, with occasional digressions in praise of his own humble abode and the improvements it was receiving, he was happily employed until the gentleman joined him, and he found in Mrs. Phillips a very attentive listener, whose opinion of his consequence increased with what she heard, and who was resolving to retail it all among her neighbors as soon as she could. To the girls, who could not listen to their cousin, and who had nothing to do but wish for an instrument and examine their own indifferent imitations of china on the mantelpiece, the interval of waiting appeared very long. It was over at last, however. The gentleman did approach, and when Mr. Wickham walked into the room, Elizabeth felt she had neither been seeing him before nor thinking of him since with the smallest degree of unreasonable admiration. The officers of the regiment were in general a very creditable, gentlemanlike set, and the best of them were of the present party. But Mr. Wickham was far beyond them all in person, countenance, air, and walk, as they were superior to the broad-faced, stuffy Uncle Phillips, breathing port wine who followed him into the room. Mr. Wickham was the happy man towards whom almost every female eye was turned, and Elizabeth was the happy woman by whom he finally seated himself, and the agreeable manner in which he immediately fell into conversation, though it was only on its being a wet night, made her feel that the commonest, dullest, most threadbare topic might be rendered interesting by the skill of the speaker. With such rivals for the notice of the fair as Mr. Wickham and the officers, Mr. Collins seemed to sink into insignificance. To the young ladies, he was certainly nothing, and he had still, but he had still at intervals a kind of listener with Mrs. Phillips, and was by her watchfulness most abundantly supplied with coffee and muffin. When the card tables were placed, he had the opportunity of obliging her in turn by sitting down to whist. I know little of the game at present said he, but I shall be glad to improve myself, for in my situation in life, Mrs. Phillips was very glad for his compliance, but could not wait for his reason. Mr. Wickham did not play at whist, and with ready delight was received at the other table between Elizabeth and Lydia. At first there seemed danger of Lydia's engrossing him entirely, for she was a most determined talker. But being likewise extremely fond of lottery tickets, she soon grew too much interested in the game, too eager in making bets and exclaiming after prizes to have attention for any one in particular. Allowing for the common demands of the game, Mr. Wickham was therefore at leisure to talk to Elizabeth, and she was very willing to hear him, though what she chiefly wished to hear she could not hope to be bold, the history of his acquaintance with Mr. Darcy. She dared not even mention that gentleman. She dared not even mention that gentleman. Her curiosity, however, was unexpectedly relieved. Mr. Wickham began to subject himself. He inquired how far Netherfield was from Meryton, and after receiving her answer, asked in a hesitating manner how long Mr. Darcy had been staying there. About a month, said Elizabeth, and then, unwilling to let the subject drop, added, 
He's a man of very large property in Derbyshire, I understand. Yes, replied Mr. Wickham. His estate there is a noble one, a clear 10,000 per annum. You could not have met with a person more capable of giving you certain information on that head than myself, for I've been connected with his family in a particular manner from my infancy. Elizabeth could not but look surprised. You may well be surprised, Miss Bennet, at such an assertion, after seeing, as you probably might, the very cold manner of our meeting yesterday. Are you much acquainted with Mr. Darcy? As much as I ever wish to be, cried Elizabeth very warmly. I've spent four days in the same house with him, and I think him very disagreeable. Well, I have no right to give my opinion, said Wickham, as to his being agreeable or otherwise. I'm not qualified to form one. I've known him too long and too well to be a fair judge. It's impossible for me to be impartial, but I believe your opinion of him would be in general astonishment, and perhaps you would not express it quite so strongly anywhere else. Here you're in your own family. Upon my word, I say no more here than I might say in any house in the neighborhood except Netherfield. He's not at all liked in Hertfordshire. Everybody's disgusted with his pride. You'll not find him more favorably spoken of by anyone. I can't pretend to be sorry said Wickham, after a short interruption, that he or any other man should not be estimated beyond their deserts. But with him, I believe it does not often happen. The world is blinded by his fortune and consequence, or frightened by his high and imposing manners, and sees him only as he chooses to be seen. I should take... I should take him, even on my slight acquaintance, to be an ill-tempered man. Oh, sorry, that was Elizabeth's line. I should take him, even on my very slight acquaintance, to be an ill-tempered man. Wickham shook his head. I wonder, said he, at the next opportunity of speaking, whether he's likely to be in this country much longer. I do not at all know, but I heard something of his going away when I was at Netherfield. I hope your plans in favor of the regiment will not be affected by his being in the neighborhood. Oh, no, it's not for me to be driven away by Mr. Darcy. If he wishes to avoid seeing me, he must go. We're not on friendly terms, and it always gives me pain to meet him, but I have no reason for avoiding him, but what I might proclaim before all the world, a sense of very great ill usage and most painful regrets at his being what he is. His father, Miss Bennet, the uh, late Mr. Darcy, was one of the best men that ever breathed and the truest friend I ever had. And I can never be in company with this Mr. Darcy without being grieved to the soul by a thousand tender recollections. His behavior to myself has been scandalous, but I verily believe I could forgive him anything and everything rather than his disappointing the hopes and disgrace in the memory of his father. Elizabeth found the interest of the subject increase and listened with all her heart, but the delicacy of it prevented further inquiry. Mr. Wickham began to speak on more general topics, Meryton, the neighborhood, the society, appearing highly pleased with all that he had yet seen, and speaking of the latter with gentle but very intelligible gallantry. It was the prospect of constant society and good society, he added, which was my chief inducement to enter the regiment. I knew it to be a most respectable, agreeable corps, and my friend Denny tempted me further by his account of their present quarters and the very great attentions and excellent acquaintances Meryton had procured him. Society, I own, is necessary to me. I have been a disappointed man, and my spirits will not bear solitude. I must have employment and society. A military life is not what I intended for, but circumstances have now made it eligible. The church ought to have been my profession. I was brought up for the church, and I should at this time have been in possession of a most valuable living had it pleased the gentleman we were speaking of just now. Indeed. Yes. Yes. 
The late Mr. Darcy bequeathed me the next presentation of the best living in his gift. He's my godfather and excessively attached to me. I can't do justice to his kindness. He meant to provide for me amply and thought he had done it. But when the living fell, it was given elsewhere. Good heavens, cried Elizabeth. But how could that be? How could his will be disregarded? Why, why did you not seek legal redress? There was just such an informality in the terms of the bequest as to give me no hope from law. A man of honor could not have doubted the intention, but Mr. Darcy chose to doubt it or to treat it as a merely conditional recommendation and to assert that I had forfeited all claim to it by extravagance, impudence, in short, anything or nothing. Certain it is that the living became vacant two years ago, exactly as I was of an age to hold it, and that it was given to another man. And no less certain is it that I can't accuse myself of having really done anything to deserve to lose it. I have a warm, unguarded temper, and I may have spoken my opinion of him and to him too freely. I can recall nothing worse. But the fact is that we're a very different sort of men, and that he hates me. This is quite shocking. He deserves to be publicly disgraced. Some time or other he will be, but it shall not be by me. Till I can forget his father, I can never defy or expose him. Elizabeth honored him for such feelings and thought him handsomer as ever as he expressed him. By what, said she after a pause, can have been his motive? What can have induced him to behave so cruelly? A thorough, determined dislike of me, a, a dislike which I cannot but attribute in some measure to jealousy. Had the late Mr. Darcy liked me less, his son might have borne with me better, but his father's uncommon attachment to me irritated me. I believe, very early in life. and He had not a temper to bear that sort of competition in which we stood, the sort of preference which was often given to me. I had not thought Mr. Darcy so bad as this, though I have never liked him. I had not thought so very ill of him. I had supposed him to be despising his fellow creatures in general, but did not suspect of him descending to such malicious revenge, such injustice. Such inhumanity as this. After a few minutes' reflection, however, she continued, I do remember his boasting one day at Netherfield of the implacability of his resentments and of his having an unforgiven temper. His disposition must be dreadful. I will not trust myself on the subject, replied Wickham. I can hardly be just to him. Elizabeth was again deep in thought and after a time exclaimed, to treat in such a manner the godson, the friend, the favorite of his father. She could have added, a young man too like you whose very countenance may vouch for your being amiable. But she contented herself with, and one too who had probably been his companion from childhood, connected together, as I think you said, in the closest manner. We were born in the same parish, within the same park. The greatest part of our youth was passed together inmates of the same house, sharing the same amusements, objects of the same parental care. My father began life in the profession which your uncle, Mr. Phillips, appears to do so much credit to, but he gave up everything to be of use to the late Mr. Darcy and devoted all his time to the care of the Pemberley property. He was most highly esteemed by Mr. Darcy, a most intimate, confidential friend. Mr. Darcy often acknowledged himself to be under the greatest obligations to my father's active superintendence, and when immediately before my father's death Mr. Darcy gave him a voluntary promise of providing for me, I am convinced that he felt it to be as much of a debt of gratitude to him as of his affection to myself. "'How strange!' cried Elizabeth. "'How abominable!' I wonder that the very pride of this Mr. Darcy has not made him just to you. If from no better motive, that he should not have been too proud to be dishonest. For dishonesty, I must call it. 
It is wonderful, replied Wickham, for almost all his actions may be traced to pride, and pride had often been his best friend. It has connected him nearer with virtue than any other feeling. But we are none of us consistent, and in his behavior to me there were stronger impulses even than pride. Can such abominable pride as his ever have done him any good? Yes, it's often led him to be liberal and generous, to give his money freely, to display hospitality, to assist his tenants and relieve the poor, family pride and filial pride, for he was very proud of what his father was, have done this, not to appear to disgrace his family, to degenerate from the popular qualities or lose the influence of the Pemberley House as a powerful motive. He has also brotherly pride, which, with some brotherly affection, makes him a very kind and careful guardian of his sister, and you'll hear him generally cried up as the most attentive and best of the brothers. What sort of girl is Miss Darcy? He shook his head. I wish I could call her amiable. It gives me pain to speak ill of a Darcy, but she is too much like her brother. Very, very proud. As a child, she was affectionate and pleasing and extremely fond of me, and I have devoted hours and hours to her amusement, but she's nothing to me now. She's a handsome girl, about 15 or 16, and I understand highly accomplished. Since her father's death, her home has been in London, where a lady lives with her and superintends her education. After many pauses and many trials of other subjects, Elizabeth could not help reverting once more to the first and saying, I am astonished at his intimacy with Mr. Bingley. How can Mr. Bingley, who seems good humor itself and is, I really believe, truly amiable, be in friendship with such a man? How can they suit each other? Do you know Mr. Bingley? Not at all. He is sweet, tempered, uh, amiable, charming man. He cannot know what Mr. Darcy is. Probably not, but Mr. Darcy can please where he chooses. He does not want abilities. He can be a conversable companion if he thinks of it worth his while. Among those who are at all his equals in consequence, he is a very different man from what he is to the less prosperous. His pride never deserts him. But with the rich, he's liberal-minded, just, sincere, rational, honorable, and perhaps agreeable, allowing something for fortune and figure. The whist party soon afterwards breaking up, the players gathered round the other table, and Mr. Collins took his station between his cousin Elizabeth and Mrs. Phillips. The usual inquiries as to his success was made by the latter. It had not been very great. He had lost every point. But when Mrs. Phillips began to express her concern thereupon, he assured her with much earnest gravity that it was not of the least importance, that he considered the money as a mere trifle, and begged that she should not make herself uneasy. "'I know very well, madam,' said he, "'that when a person sits down to a card game, they must take their chances of these things.' And happily, I am not in such circumstances as to make five shillings any object. There are certainly many who could not say the same. But thanks to Lady Catherine de Bourgh, I am removed far beyond the necessity of regarding little matters. Mr. Wickham's attention was caught, and after observing Mr. Collins for a few minutes, he asked Elizabeth in a low voice whether her relation was very intimately acquainted with the family of de Bourgh. Lady Catherine de Bourgh, she replied, has very lately given him a living. I hardly know how Mr. Collins was first introduced to her notice, but he certainly has not known her long. You know, of course, that Lady Catherine de Bourgh and Lady Anne Darcy were sisters, consequently that she is aunt to the present Mr. Darcy. No, indeed, I did not. I knew nothing at all of Lady Catherine's connections. I never heard of her existence till the day before yesterday. Her daughter, Miss de Bourgh, will have a very large fortune, and it's believed that she and her cousin will unite the two estates. This information made Elizabeth smile, and she thought of poor Miss Bingley. Vain indeed must be all her attentions, vain and useless her affection for his sister and her praise of himself, 
if he were already self-destined for another. Mr. Collins, said she, speaks highly both of Lady Catherine and her daughter, but from some particulars that he has related of her ladyship, I suspect his gratitude misleads him, and that in spite of her being his patroness, she's an arrogant, conceited woman. I believe her to be both in a great degree, replied Wickham. I've not seen her for many years, but I very well remember that I never liked her, and that her manners were dictatorial and insolent. She has the reputation of being remarkably sensible and clever, but I rather believe she derives part of her abilities from her rank and fortune, part from her authoritative manner, and the rest from the pride of her nephew, who chooses that everyone connected with him should have an understanding of the first class. Elizabeth allowed that he had given a very rational account of it, and they continued talking together with mutual satisfaction till supper put an end to cards and gave the rest of the ladies their share of Mr. Wickham's attentions. There could be no conversation in the noise of Mrs. Phillips' supper party, but his manners recommended him to everybody. Whatever he said was said well, and whatever he did done gracefully. Elizabeth went away with her head full of him. She could think of nothing but of Mr. Wickham and of what he had told her all the way home. There was not time for her even to mention his name as they went, for neither Lydia nor Mr. Collins were once silent. Lydia talked incessantly of lottery tickets and the fish she had lost and the fish she had won. And Mr. Collins, in describing the civility of Mr. and Mrs. Phillips, protesting that he did not in the least regard his losses at whist, enumerating all the dishes at supper, and repeatedly fearing that he crowded his cousins, had more to say than he could well manage before the carriage stopped at Longburn House. Chapter 17 Elizabeth related to Jane the next day what had passed between Mr. Wickham and herself. Jane listened with astonishment and concern. She knew not how to believe that Mr. Darcy could be so unworthy of Mr. Bingley's regard, and yet it was not in her nature to question the veracity of a young man of such amiable appearance as Wickham. The possibility of his having endured such unkindness was enough to interest all her tender feelings, and nothing remained therefore to be done but to think well of them both, to defend the conduct of each, and throw into the account of accident or mistake whatever could not be otherwise explained. They have both, said she, been deceived, I dare say, in some way or other, of which we can form no idea. Interested people have perhaps misrepresented each to the other. It is, in short, impossible for us to conjecture the causes or circumstances which may have alienated them without actual blame on either side. Very true indeed. And now, my dear Jane, what have you got to say on behalf of the interested people who have probably been concerned in the business? Do, do clear them, too, or we shall be obliged to think ill of somebody? Laugh as much as you choose, but you'll not laugh me out of my opinion. My dearest Lizzie, do but consider in what a disgraceful light it places Mr. Darcy to be treating his father's favorite in such a manner, one whom his father had promised to provide for. It's impossible. No man of common humanity, no man of... No man who had any value for his character could be capable of it. Can his most intimate friends be so excessively deceived by him? Oh, no. I can much more easily believe Mr. Bingley's being imposed on than that Mr. Wickham should have invented such a history of himself as he gave me last night. Names, facts, everything mentioned without ceremony. If it be not so, let Mr. Darcy contradict it. Besides, there was truth in his looks. It is difficult indeed. It is distressing. One does not know what to think. I beg your pardon. One knows exactly what to think. But Jane could think with certainty on only one point, that Mr. Bingley, if he had been imposed on, would have much to suffer when the affair became public. The two young ladies were summoned from the shrubbery, where this conversation passed, by the arrival of the very persons of whom they had been speaking. Mr. Bingley and his sisters came to give their personal invitation for the long-expected ball at Netherfield, which was fixed for the following Tuesday. 
The two ladies were delighted to see their dear friend again, called it an age since they had met, and repeatedly asked what she had been doing with herself since their separation. To the rest of the family, they had paid little attention, avoiding Mrs. Bennett as much as possible, saying not much to Elizabeth and nothing at all to the others. They were soon gone again, rising from their seats with an activity which took their brother by surprise and hurrying off as if eager to escape from Mrs. Bennett's civilities. The prospect of the Netherfield Ball was extremely agreeable to every female of the family. Miss Bennett chose to consider it as given in compliment to her eldest daughter and was particularly flattered by receiving the invitation from Mr. Bingley himself instead of a ceremonious card. Jane pictured to herself a happy evening in the society of her two friends and the attentions of her brother, and Elizabeth thought with pleasure of dancing a great deal with Mr. Wickham and of seeing a confirmation of everything in Mr. Darcy's look and behavior. The happiness anticipated by Catherine and Lydia depended less on any single event or any particular person, for though they each, like Elizabeth, meant to dance half the evening with Mr. Wickham, he was by no means the only partner who could satisfy them, and a ball was, at any rate, a ball, and even Mary could assure her family that she had no distinction for it. Elizabeth's spirits were so high on this occasion that though she did not often speak unnecessarily to Mr. Collins, she could not help asking him whether he intended to accept Mr. Bingley's invitation, and if he did, whether he would think it proper to join in the evening's amusement and she was rather surprised to find that he entertained no scruple whatever on that head, and was very far from dreading a rebuke either from the Archbishop or Lady Catherine de Bourgh by venturing to dance. "'I am by no means of the opinion, I assure you,' said he, "'that a ball of this kind given by a young man of character to respectable people can have any evil tendency.' and I'm so far from objecting to dancing myself that I shall hope to be honored by one of the hands of all my fair cousins in the course of the evening, and I'll take this opportunity of soliciting yours, Miss Elizabeth, for the first two dances especially, a preference which I trust my cousin Jane will attribute to the right cause, and not to any disrespect for her. Elizabeth felt herself completely taken in. She had fully proposed being engaged by Mr. Wickham for those very dances, and to have Mr. Collins instead. Her liveliness had never had worse times. There was no help for it, however. Mr. Wickham's happiness and her own were perforce delayed a little longer, and Mr. Collins' proposal accepted with as good a grace as she could. She was not better the pleased with his gallantry from the idea it suggested of something more. It now first struck her that she was being selected from among her sisters as worthy of being mistress of Hunsford Parsonage and of assisting to form a quadrille table at Rosen's in the absence of more eligible visitors. The idea soon reached to conviction as she observed his increasing civilities toward her and heard his frequent attempt at a compliment on her wit and veracity. And though more astonished than gratified by this effect of her charms, it was not long before her mother gave her to understand that the probability of their marriage was extremely agreeable to her. Elizabeth, however, did not choose to take the hint, being well aware that a serious dispute must be the consequence of any reply. Mr. Collins might never make the offer, and till he did, it was useless to quarrel about him. If there had not been a Netherfield ball to prepare for and talk of, the younger Miss Bennetts would have been in a very pitiable state at this time. For from the day of the invitation to the day of the ball, there was such a succession of rain as prevented their walking to Meryton once. No aunt, no officers, no news could be sought after. The very shoe roses for Netherfield were got by proxy. Even Elizabeth might have found some trial of her patience in weather which totally suspended the improvement of her acquaintance with Mr. Wickham, and nothing less than a dance on Tuesday could have made such a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday endurable to Kitty and Lydia. Chapter 18 Till Elizabeth entered the drawing room at Netherfield and looked in vain for Mr. Wickham among the cluster of red coats there assembled, a doubt of his being present 
had never occurred to her. A certainty of meeting him had not been checked by any of those recollections that might not unreasonably have alarmed her. She had dressed with more than usual care and prepared in the highest spirits for the conquest of all that remained unsubdued of his heart, trusting that it was not more than might be won in the course of the evening. But in an instant arose the dreadful suspicion of his being purposefully omitted for Mr. Darcy's pleasure in the Bingley's invitation to the officers. And though this was not exactly the case, the absolute fact of his presence was pronounced by his friend Denny, to whom Lydia eagerly applied, and who told them that Wickham had been obliged to go into town on business the day before and had not yet returned, adding, with a significant smile, I do not imagine his business would have called him away just now if he had not wanted to avoid a certain gentleman here. This part of his intelligence, though unheard by Lydia, was caught by Elizabeth, and as it assured her that Darcy was not less answerable for Wickham's absence than if her first surmise had been just, every feeling of displeasure against the former was so sharpened by immediate disappointment that she could hardly reply with tolerable civility to the polite inquiries which he directly afterwards approached to make. Attendance, forbearance, patience with Darcy was injury to Wickham. She was resolved against any sort of conversation with him, and turned away with a degree of ill humor which she could not wholly surmount even in speaking to Mr. Bingley, whose blind partiality provoked her. But Elizabeth was not formed for ill humor, and though every prospect of her own was destroyed for the evening, it could not dwell long on her spirits. And having told all her griefs to Charlotte Lucas, whom she had not seen for a week, she was soon able to make a voluntary transition to the oddities of her cousin and to point them out to her particular notice. The first two dances, however, brought a return of distress. They were dances of mortification. Mr. Collins, awkward and solemn, apologizing instead of attending, and often moving wrong without being aware of it, gave her all the shame and misery which a disagreeable partner for a couple of dances can give. The moment of her release from him was ecstasy. She danced next with an officer and had the refreshment of talking of Wickham and hearing that he was universally liked. When those dances were over, she returned to Charlotte Lucas and was in conversation with her, and she found herself suddenly addressed by Mr. Darcy, who took her so much by surprise in his application for her hand that, without knowing what she did, she accepted him. He walked away again immediately, and she was left to fret over her own want of presence of mind. Charlotte tried to console her. I dare say you'll find him very agreeable. Heaven forbid, that would be the greatest misfortune of all, to find a man agreeable whom one is determined to hate. Do not wish me such an evil. When the dancing recommenced... When the dancing recommenced, however, and Darcy approached to claim her hand... Charlotte could not help cautioning her in a whisper not to be a simpleton and allow her fancy for Wickham to make her appear unpleasant in the eyes of a man ten times his consequence. Elizabeth made no answer and took her place in the set, amazed at the dignity to which she was arrived in being allowed to stand opposite to Mr. Darcy and reading in her neighbor's looks their equal amazement in beholding it. They stood for some time without speaking a word and she began to imagine that their silence was to last through the two dances, and at first was resolved not to break it, till suddenly fancying that it would be the greater punishment to her partner to oblige him to talk, she made some slight observation on the dance. He replied and was again silent. After a pause of some minutes, she addressed him a second time with, "'It's your turn to say something now, Mr. Darcy.' I talked about the dance, and you ought to make some sort of remark on the size of the room or the number of couples. He smiled, and assured her that whatever she wished him to say should be said. He smiled, and assured her that whatever she wished him to say should be said. Very well, that will do for the present. Perhaps by and by I may observe that private balls are much pleasanter than public ones. But now we may be silent. Do you talk by rule, then, while you're dancing? Sometimes. One must speak a little, you know. It would look odd to be entirely silent for half an hour together, and yet for the advantage of some, conversation ought to be so arranged. 
as that they might have trouble of saying as little as possible. Are you consulting your own feelings in the present case, or do you imagine that you're gratifying mine? Both, replied Elizabeth archly, for I have always seen a great similarity in the turn of our minds. We are each of an unsocial, taciturn disposition, unwilling to speak unless we expect to say something that will amaze the whole room and be handed down to posterity with all the eclat of a proverb. There's no very striking resemblance of your own character, I'm sure, said he. How near it may be to mine, I cannot pretend to say. You think it a faithful portrait, undoubtedly. I must not decide on my own performance. He made no answer, and they were again silent till they had gone down the dance, when he asked her if she and her sisters did not very often walk to Meryton. She answered in the affirmative, and, unable to resist the temptation, added, when you met us there the other day, we had just been forming a new acquaintance. The effect was immediate. A deeper shade overspread his features, but he said not a word, and Elizabeth, though blaming herself for her own weakness, could not go on. At length Darcy spoke, and in a constrained manner said, Mr. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners as may ensure his making friends, whether he may be equally capable of retaining them is less certain. He has been so unlucky to lose your friendship, replied Elizabeth with emphasis, and in a manner which he was likely to suffer from all his life. Darcy made no answer, and seemed desirous of changing the subject. At that moment Sir William Lucas appeared close to them, meaning to pass through the set to the other side of the room, but on perceiving Mr. Darcy, he stopped with a bow of superior courtesy to compliment him on his dancing and his partner. I've been most highly gratified indeed, my dear sir. Such very superior dancing is not often seen. It is evident that you belong to the first circles. Allow me to say, however, that your fair partner does not disgrace you, and that I must hope to have this pleasure often repeated, especially when a certain desirable event, my dear Eliza, glancing at her sister and Bingley, shall take place. What congratulations will then flow in? I appeal to Mr. Darcy, but let me not interrupt you, sir. You will not thank me for detaining you from the bewitching converse of that young lady whose bright eyes are also upbraiding me. The latter part of this address was scarcely heard by Darcy, but Sir William's allusion to his friend seemed to strike him forcibly, and his eyes were directed with a very serious expression toward Bingley and Jane, who were dancing together. Recovering himself, however shortly, he turned to his partner and said, Sir William's interruption has made me forget what we are talking of. I do not think we were talking at all. Sir William could not have interrupted two people in the room who had less to say for themselves. We have tried two or three subjects already without success, and what we are to talk of next I cannot imagine. What do you think of books? he said, smiling. Books? Oh, no, I'm sure we never read the same, or not with the same feelings. I'm sorry you think so, but if that be the case, there can be at least no want of subject. We may compare our different opinions. No, I cannot talk of books in a ballroom. My head is already full of something else. Present always occupies you in such scenes, does it? said he with a look of doubt. Yes, always, she replied, without knowing what she said, for her thoughts had wandered far from the subject, and soon afterwards appeared by her suddenly exclaiming, I remember hearing you once say, Mr. Darcy, that you hardly ever forgave, that your resentment once created was unappeasable. You're very cautious, I suppose, as to its being created. I am, said he with a firm voice. And never allow yourself to be blinded by prejudice? I hope not. It is particularly incumbent on those who never change their opinion to be secure of judging properly at first. May I ask what these questions tend? Merely to the illustration of your character, she said, endeavoring to shake off her gravity. I'm trying to make it out. And what is your success? She shook her head. I don't get on at all. I hear such different accounts of you as puzzle me exceedingly. I can readily believe answered he gravely, that reports may vary greatly with respect to me. 
and I wish, Miss Bennett, that you were not to sketch my character at the present moment, as there is reason to fear that the performance would reflect no credit on either. But if I do not take your likeness now, I may never have another opportunity. I would by no means suspend any pleasure of yours, he coldly replied. She said no more, and they went down to the other dance and parted in silence, and on each side dissatisfied, though not to an unequal degree, for in Darcy's breast there was a tolerable, powerful feeling towards her, which soon procured her pardon and directed all his anger against another. They had not long separated when Miss Bingley came towards her with an expression of civil disdain, and with an expression of civil disdain accosted her. So, Miss Eliza, I hear you're quite delighted with George Wickham. Your sister's been talking to me about him and asking me a thousand questions, and I find that the young men quite forgot to tell you, among his other communication, that he was the son of old Wickham, the late Mr. Darcy's steward. Let me recommend you, however, as a friend, not to give implicit confidence to all his assertions. For as to Mr. Darcy's using him ill, it's perfectly false. For on the contrary, he's always been remarkably kind to him, though George Wickham has treated Mr. Darcy in a most infamous manner. I don't know the particulars, but I know very well that Mr. Darcy is not in the least to blame, that he cannot bear to hear George Wickham mentioned, and that though my brother thought that he could not well avoid including him in his invitation to the officers, he was excessively glad to find that he had taken himself out of the way. His coming into the country at all is a most insolent thing indeed, and I wonder how he could presume to do it. I pity you, Miss Eliza, for this discovery of your favorite's guilt, but really, considering his descent, one could not expect much better. His guilt and his descent appear by your account to be the same, said Elizabeth angrily, for I have heard you accuse him of nothing worse than being the son of Mr. Darcy's steward, and of that, I can assure you, he informed me himself. I beg your pardon, replied Miss Bingley, turning away with a sneer. Excuse my interference. It was kindly meant. Insolent girl, said Elizabeth to herself. You're much mistaken if you expect to influence me by such a paltry attack as this. I see nothing in it but your own willful ignorance and malice of Mr. Darcy. She then sought her eldest sister, who had undertaken to make inquiries on the same subject of Bingley. Jane met her with a smile of such sweet complacency, a glow of such happy expression, as sufficiently marked how well she was satisfied with the occurrences of the evening. Elizabeth instantly read her feelings, and at that moment solicitude for Wickham, resentment against his enemies, and everything else— gave way before the hope of Jane being in the fairest way for happiness. "'I want to know,' she said, with a countenance no less smiling than her sister's, "'what you have learnt about Mr. Wickham. But perhaps you've been too pleasantly engaged to think of any third person, in which case you may be sure of my pardon.' "'No,' replied Jane. "'I have not forgotten him, but I have nothing satisfactory to tell you. Mr. Bingley does not know the whole of his history and is quite ignorant of the circumstances which have principally offended Mr. Darcy. But he'll vouch for the good conduct, the property, and the honor of his friend, and is perfectly convinced that Mr. Wickham has deserved much less attention from Mr. Darcy than he has received. And I'm sorry to say that by his account, as well as his sister's, Mr. Wickham is by no means a respectable young man. I'm afraid he's been very impudent and has deserved to lose Mr. Darcy's regard. Mr. Bingley does not know Mr. Wickham himself? No, he never met him till the other morning at Meryton. This account, then, is what he received from Mr. Darcy. I'm very satisfied. But what does he say of the living? He does not exactly recollect the circumstances, though he has heard them from Mr. Darcy more than once, but he believes that it was left to him conditionally only. I have not a doubt of Mr. Bingley's sincerity, said Elizabeth warmly, but you must excuse my not being convinced by assurances only. Mr. Bingley's defense of his friend was a very able one, I dare say, but since he is unacquainted with several parts of the story and has learned the rest from that friend himself, I shall venture to think of both gentlemen as I did before. She then changed the discourse to one more gratifying to each and on which there could be no difference of sentiment.
Elizabeth listened with delight to the happy, though modest, hopes which Jane entertained of Mr. Bingley's regard, and said all in her power to heighten her confidence in it. On their being joined by Mr. Bingley himself, Elizabeth withdrew to Miss Lucas, to whose inquiry after the pleasantness of her partner she had scarcely replied before Mr. Collins came up to him, and told her with great exultation that she had just been so fortunate as to make a more important discovery. I have found out, said he, by a singular accident, that there is now in the room a, a near relation of my patroness. I happened to overhear the gentleman himself mentioning to the young lady who does the honors of the house the names of his cousin, Miss de Berg, and of her mother, Lady Catherine. How wonderfully these sort of things occur. Who would have thought of my meeting with, perhaps, a nephew of Lady Catherine de Berg in his assembly? I am most thankful that the discovery is made in time for me to pay my respects to him, which I am now going to do, and trust he will excuse my not having done it before. My total ignorance of the connection must plead my apology. You are not going to introduce yourself to Mr. Darcy. Indeed I am. I shall entreat his pardon for not having done it earlier. I believe him to be Lady Catherine's nephew. It will be in my power to assure him that her ladyship was quite well yesterday night. Elizabeth tried hard to dissuade him from such a scheme, assuring him that Mr. Darcy would consider his addressing him without introduction as an impertinent freedom rather than a compliment to his aunt, that it was not in the least necessary that there should be any notice on either side, and if it were, it must belong to Mr. Darcy the superior in consequence, to begin the acquaintance. Mr. Collins listened to her with the determined air of following his own inclination, and when she ceased speaking, replied thus, My dear Miss Elizabeth, I have the highest opinion in the world of your excellent judgment in all matters within the scope of your own understanding. But permit me to say that there must be a wide difference between the established forms of ceremony among the laity and those which regulate the clergy. Forgive me leave to observe that I consider the clerical office as equal in point of dignity to the highest rank in the kingdom, provided that a proper humility of behavior at the same time maintained. You must therefore allow me to follow the dictates of my conscience on this occasion, which leads me to perform what I look on as a point of duty. Pardon me for neglecting my profit by your advice, which on every other subject shall be my constant guide, though in the case before us I consider myself more fitted by education and habitual study to decide on what is right than a young lady like yourself. And with a low bow, he left her, to attack Mr. Darcy, whose reception of his advances she eagerly watched, and whose astonishment at being so addressed was very evident. Her cousin prefaced his speech with a solemn bow, and though she could not hear a word of it, she felt it as if hearing it all, and saw in the motion of his lips the word apology, Hunsford, and Lady Catherine de Bourgh. It vexed her to see him expose himself to such a man, Mr. Darcy was eyeing him with unrestrained wonder, and when at last Mr. Collins allowed him time to speak, replied with an air of distant civility. Mr. Collins, however, was not discouraged from speaking again, and Mr. Darcy's contempt seemed abundantly increasing with the length of his second speech, and at the end of it he only made him a slight bow and moved another way. Mr. Collins then returned to Elizabeth. I have no reason, I assure you, said he, to be dissatisfied at my reception. Mr. Darcy seemed much pleased with the attention. He answered me with the utmost civility, and even paid me the compliment of saying that he was so well convinced of Lady Catherine's discernment as to be certain she could never bestow a favor unworthily. (laughs) It really was a very handsome thought. Upon the whole, I am much pleased with him. As Elizabeth no longer had any interest of her own to pursue, she turned her attention almost entirely on her sister and Mr. Bingley, and the train of agreeable reflections which her observations gave birth to made her perhaps almost as happy as Jane. 
She saw her in idea settled in that very house, in all the felicity which a marriage of true affection could bestow, and she felt capable, under such circumstances, of endeavoring even to like Bingley's two sisters. Her mother's thoughts, she plainly saw, were bent the same way, and she determined not to venture near her, lest she might hear too much. When they sat down to supper, therefore, she considered it a most unlucky perverseness, which placed them within one of each other, and deeply was she vexed to find that her mother was talking to that one person, Lady Lucas, freely, openly, and of nothing else but her expectation that Jane would soon be married to Bingley. It was an animating subject, and Mrs. Bennet seemed incapable of fatigue while enumerating the advantages of the match. His being such a charming young man, and so rich, and, and living but three miles from them, were the first points of self-gratulation. And then it was such a comfort to think how fond the two sisters were of Jane, and to be certain that they must desire the connection as much as she could do. It was, moreover, such a promising thing for her younger daughters, as Jane's marrying so greatly must throw them in the way of other rich men. And lastly, it was so pleasant at her time of life to be able to consign her single daughters to the care of their sister, that she might not be obliged to go into company more than she liked. It was necessary to make this circumstance a matter of pleasure, because on such occasions it is the etiquette, but no one was less likely than Mrs. Bennet to find comfort in staying home at any period of her life. She concluded with many good wishes that Lady Lucas might soon be equally fortunate, though evidently and triumphantly believing there was no chance of it. In vain did Elizabeth endeavor to check the rapidity of her mother's words or persuade her to describe her felicity in a less audible whisper, for to her inexpressible vexation, she could perceive that the chief of it was overheard by Darcy, who sat opposite to them. Her mother only scolded her for being nonsensical. "'What is Mr. Darcy to me, pray, that I should be afraid of him? I'm sure we owe him no particular civility as to be obliged to say nothing he may not like to hear. For heaven's sake, madam, speak lower. What advantage can it be for you to offend Mr. Darcy? You will never be recommended yourself to his friend by so doing. Nothing that she could say, however, had any influence. Her mother would talk of her views in the same intelligible tone. Elizabeth blushed and blushed again with shame and vexation. She could not help frequently glancing her eye at Mr. Darcy, though every glance convinced her of what she dreaded. For though he was not always looking at her mother, she was convinced that his attention was invariably fixed by her. The expression of his face changed gradually from indignant contempt to a composed and steady gravity. At length, however, Mrs. Bennet had no more to say, and Lady Lucas, who had been long yawning at the repetition of delights which she saw no likelihood of sharing, was left to the comforts of cold ham and chicken. Elizabeth now began to revive, but not long was the interval of tranquility, for when supper was over, singing was talked of, and she had the mortification of seeing Mary, after very little entreaty, preparing to oblige the company. By many significant looks and silent entreaties did she endeavor to prevent such a proof of complacence, but in vain. Mary would not understand them. Such an opportunity of exhibiting was delightful to her, and she began her song. Elizabeth's eyes were fixed on her with a most painful sensation, and she watched her progress with an impatience which was very ill rewarded at their close. For Mary, on receiving amongst the thanks of the table the hint of a hope that she might be prevailed on to favor them again, after a pause of half a minute began another. Mary's powers were by no means fitted for such a display. Her voice was weak and her manner affected. Elizabeth was in agonies. She looked at Jane to see how she bore it, but Jane was very composedly talking to Bingley. She looked at his two sisters and saw them making signs of derision at each other, and at Darcy, who continued, however, imperturbably grave. She looked at her father to entreat his interference, lest Mary should be singing all night. He took the hint, and when Mary had finished her second song, said aloud, "'That'll do extremely well, child. You have delighted us long enough.' Let the other young ladies have time to exhibit. 
Mary, though pretending not to hear, was somewhat disconcerted, and Elizabeth, sorry for, and sorry for her father's speech, was afraid her anxiety had done no good. Others of the party were now applied to. If I, said Mr. Collins, were so fortunate as to be able to sing, I should have great pleasure, I am sure, in obliging the company with an air. For I consider music as a very innocent diversion and perfectly compatible with the profession of a clergyman. I do not mean, however, to assert that we can be justified in devoting too much of our time to music, for there are certainly other things to be attended to. The rector of a parish has much to do. In the first place, he must make such an agreement for tithes as may be beneficial to himself and not offensive to his patron. He must write his own sermons, and the time that remains will not be too much for his parish duties and the care of the improvement of his dwelling, which he cannot be excused from making as comfortable as possible. And I do not think of it uh, of light importance that he should have attentive and conciliatory manner towards everybody, especially towards those to whom he owes his preferment. I cannot acquit him of that duty, nor could I well think of the man who should omit an occasion of testifying his respect towards anybody connected with the family. And with a bow to Mr. Darcy, he concluded his speech, which had been spoken so loud as to be heard by half the room. Many stared. Many smiled, but no one looked more amused than Mr. Bennet himself, while his wife seriously commended Mr. Collins for having spoken so sensibly, and observed in a half-whisper to Lady Lucas that he was a remarkably clever, good kind of young man. To Elizabeth it appeared that had her family made an agreement to expose themselves as much as a had her family made an agreement to expose themselves as much as they could during the evening, it would have been impossible for them to play their parts with any more spirit or finer success. And happy did she think it for Bingley and her sister that some sort of exhibition had escaped his notice, and that his feelings were not a sort to be much dis and that his feelings were not the sort to be much distressed by the folly which he must have witnessed. That his two sisters and Mr. Darcy, however, should have had such an opportunity of ridiculing her relations was bad enough, and she could not determine whether the silent contempt of the gentlemen or the insolent smiles of the ladies were more tolerable, were more intolerable. The rest of the evening brought her little amusement. She was teased by Mr. Collins, who continued most personal who continued most perseveringly by her side, and though he could not prevail on her to dance with him again, put it out of her power to dance with others. In vain did she entreat him to stand up with somebody else and offer to introduce him to any young lady in the room. He assured her that as to dancing, he was perfectly indifferent to it, and that his chief object was by delicate attentions to recommend himself to her and that he should therefore make a point of remaining close to her the whole evening. There was no arguing upon such a project. She owed her greatest relief to her friend Miss Lucas, who often joined them and good-naturedly engaged Mr. Collins' conversation to herself. She was at least free from the offenses of Mr. Darcy's further notice, though often standing within a very short distance of her, quite disengaged, he never came near enough to speak. She felt it to be the probable consequence of her allusions to Mr. Wickham and rejoiced in it. The Longbourn party were the last of all the company to depart, and by a maneuver of Mrs. Bennet had to wait for their carriage a quarter of an hour after everybody else was gone, which gave them time to see how heartily they were wished away by some of the family. Mrs. Hurst and her sister scarcely opened their mouths except to complain of fatigue, and were evidently impatient to have the house to themselves. They repulsed every attempt of Mrs. Bennet at conversation, and by doing so threw a lanker over the whole party, which was very little relieved by the long speeches of Mr. Collins, who was complimenting Mr. Bingley and his sisters on the elegance of their entertainment and the hospitality and politeness which had marked their behavior to their guests. Mr. Darcy said nothing at all. Mr. Bennet, in equal silence, was enjoying the scene. Mr. Bingley and Jane were standing together, a little detached from the rest, and talked only to each other. 
Elizabeth preserved as steady a silence as either Mrs. Hurst or Miss Bingley, and even Lydia was too much fatigued to utter more than the occasional explanation of, Lord, how tired I am, accompanied by a violent yawn. When at length they rose to take leave, Mrs. Bennet was most pressingly civil in her hope of seeing the whole family soon at Longbourn, and addressed herself especially to Mr. Bingley to, to assure him how happy he would make them by eating a family dinner with them at any time without the ceremony of a formal invitation. Bingley was all grateful pleasure, and he readily engaged for taking the earliest opportunity of waiting on her after his return from London, whether he was obliged to go the next day for a short time. Mrs. Bennet was perfectly satisfied, and quitted the house under the delightful persuasion that, allowing for the necessary preparations of settlements, new carriages, and wedding clothes, she should undoubtedly see her daughter settled at Netherfield in the course of three or four months. Of having another daughter married to Mr. Collins, she thought with equal certainty, and with considerable, though not equal, pleasure. Elizabeth was the least dear to her of all her children, and though the man and the match were quite good enough for her, the worth of each was eclipsed by Mr. Bingley and Netherfield. Chapter 19 The next day opened a new scene at Longburn. Mr. Collins made his declaration in form. Having resolved to do it without loss of time, as his leave of absence extended only to the following Saturday, and having no feelings of diffidence to make it distressing to himself even at the moment, he set about it in a very orderly manner, with all the observances which he supposed a regular part of the business. On finding Mrs. Bennet, Elizabeth, and one of the younger girls together soon after breakfast, he addressed the mother in these words. May I hope, madam, for your interest with your fair daughter Elizabeth when I solicit for the honor of a private audience with her in the course of this morning? Before Elizabeth, my stomach's growling. Before Elizabeth had time for anything but a blush of surprise, Mrs. Bennet answered instantly, Oh, dear, yes, certainly. I'm sure Lizzie will be very happy. I'm sure she can have no objection. Come, Kitty, I want you upstairs. And gathering her work together, she was hastening up when Elizabeth called out, Dear madam, do not go. I beg you will not go. Mr. Collins must excuse me. He can have nothing to say to me that anybody need not hear. I'm going to go away myself. No, no, nonsense, Lizzie. I desire you to stay where you are. And upon Elizabeth seeming really, with vexed and embarrassed looks about to escape, she added, Lizzie, I insist upon your staying in here, Mr. Collins. Elizabeth could not but oppose such an injunction and a moment's consideration making her also sensible that it would be wisest to get it over as soon and as quietly as possible, she sat down again and tried to conceal, by incessant employment, the feelings which were divided between distress and aversion. Mrs. Bennet and Kitty walked off, and as soon as they were gone, Mr. Collins began. Believe me, my dear Miss Elizabeth, that your modesty, so far from doing you any disservice, rather adds to your other perfections. You would have, you would have been much less amiable in my eyes had there not been this little unwillingness which allowed me to assure you that I have your respected mother's permission for this address. You can hardly doubt the purport of my discourse. However, your natural delicate my intentions have been too marked to be mistaken. Almost as soon as I entered the house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. And before I am run away with my feelings on the subject, perhaps it would be advisable for me to state my reasons for marrying, and, moreover, for coming into Hertfordshire with the design of selecting a wife as I certainly did. The idea of Mr. Collins, with all his solemn composure, being run away with his feelings made Elizabeth so near laughing that she couldn't use the short pause he allowed in any attempt to stop him further. And he continued, My reasons for marrying are, first, that I think it a right thing for every clergyman in easy circumstances, like myself, to set the example of matrimony in his parish. Secondly, that I'm convinced that it will add very greatly to my happiness. And thirdly, which perhaps I ought to have mentioned earlier, that it's the particular advice and recommendation of the very noble lady whom I have the honor of calling patroness. Twice she condescended to give me her opinion, unasked too, on this subject, 
And it was but the very Saturday night before I left Huntsford, between our pools at Codrill, when Mrs. Jenkins was arranging Mr. Berg's footstool, that she said, Mr. Collins, you must marry. A clergyman like you must marry. Choose properly. Choose a gentlewoman for my sake and for your own. Let her be an active, useful sort of person, not brought up high, but able to make a small income go a good way. This is my advice. Find such a woman as soon as you can. Bring her to Hunsford, and I'll visit her. Allow me, by the way, to observe, my fair cousin, that I did not reckon the notice and kindness of Lady Catherine de Bourgh as among the least of my advantages in, in my power to offer. You'll find her manners beyond anything I can describe, and your wit and vivacity, I think, must be acceptable to her, especially when tempered with the silence and respect which her rank will inevitably excite. Thus much for my general intention in favor of matrimony. It remains to be told why my views were directed towards Longburn instead of my own neighborhood, where I can assure you there are many amiable young women, but the fact is that being as I am to inherit the estate after the death of your honored father, who, however, may live many years longer, I could not satisfy myself without resolving to choose a wife from among his daughters, that the loss to them might be as little as possible when the melancholy event takes place which, moreover, as I've already said, may not be for several years. This has been my motive, my fair cousin, and I flatter myself it will not sink me in your esteem. And now nothing remains but for me to assure you in the most animated language of the violence of my affection. To fortune I am perfectly indifferent, and shall make no demand of that nature on your father, since I am well aware that it could not be complied with, and that one thousand pounds in the four percents, which will not be yours till after your mother's decease, is all that you may ever be entitled to. On that head, therefore, I shall be uniformly silent, and you may assure yourself that no ungenerous approach shall ever pass my lips when we're married. It was absolutely necessary to interrupt him now. You are too hasty, sir, she cried. You forget that I made no answer. Let me do it without further loss of time. Accept my thanks for the compliment you are paying me. Uh, I am very sensible of the honor of your proposals, but it is impossible for me to do otherwise than to decline them. I am not now to learn replied Mr. Collins with a formal wave of the hand, that it is usual with young ladies to reject the addresses of the man whom they secretly mean to accept when he first applies for their favor, and that sometimes the refusal is repeated a second or even a third time. I am therefore by no means discouraged by what you have just said, and shall hope to lead you to the altar ere long. Upon my word, sir, cried Elizabeth. Your hope is a rather extraordinary one after my declaration. I do assure you that I'm not one of those young ladies, if such young ladies there are, who are so daring as to risk their happiness on the chance of being asked a second time. I'm perfectly serious in my refusal. You could not make me happy, and I am convinced that I am the last woman in the world who could ever make you so. Nay, were your friend Lady Catherine to know me, I am persuaded she would find me in every respect ill-qualified for the situation. Were it certain that Lady Catherine would think so, said Mr. Collins gravely, but I cannot imagine that her ladyship would at all disprove of you. And you may be certain, when I have the honor of seeing her again, I shall speak in the very highest terms of your modesty, economy, and other amiable qualification. Indeed, Mr. Collins, all praise of me will be unnecessary. You must give me leave to judge for myself and pay me the compliment of believing what I say. I wish you very happy and very rich, and by refusing your hand, do all in my power to prevent you being otherwise. In making me the offer, you must have satisfied the delicacy of your feelings with regard to my family, and may take possession of Longburn Estate whenever it falls without any self-reproach. This matter may be considered, therefore, as finally settled, and rising as she thus spoke, she would have quitted the room had Mr. Collins not thus addressed her. When I do myself the honor of speaking to you next on the subject, 
I shall hope to receive a more favorable answer than you have now given me, though I am far from accusing you of cruelty at present, because I know it to be the established custom of your sex to reject a man on the first application, and perhaps you have now even said as much to encourage my suit as would be consistent with the true delicacy of the female character. Really, Mr. Collins, cried Elizabeth with some warmth, you puzzle me exceedingly. If what I have hitherto said can appear to you in the form of encouragement, I know not how to express my refusal in such a way as to convince you of its being one. You must give me leave to flatter myself, my dear cousin, that your refusal of my addresses is merely words, of course. My reasons for believing it are briefly these. It does not appear to me that my hand is unworthy of your acceptance, or that the establishment I can offer would be any other than highly desirable. My situation in life, my connections with the family of de Berg, and my relationship to your own are circumstances highly in my favor, and you should take it into further consideration that in spite of your manifold attractions, it is by no means certain that another offer of marriage may ever be made to you. Your portion is unhappily so small that it will in all likelihood undo the effects of your loveliness and amiable qualifications. And as I therefore conclude that you are not serious in your rejection of me, I shall choose to attribute it to your wish of increasing my love by suspense, according to the usual practice of elegant females. I do assure you, sir, that I have no pretensions whatever to that kind of elegance which consists in tormenting a respectable man. I would rather be paid the compliment of being believed sincere." I thank you again and again for your honor you have done me in your proposals, but to accept them is absolutely impossible. My feelings in every respect forbid it. Can I speak plainer? Do not consider me now as an elegant female intending to plague you, but as a rational creature speaking the truth from her heart. You are uniformly charming, cried he, with an air of awkward gallantry, but and I am persuaded that when sanctioned by the express authority of both your excellent parents, my proposals will not fail of being acceptable. To such perverseness in willful deception, Elizabeth would make no reply, and immediately, and in silence, withdrew, determined that if he persisted in considering her repeated refusals as flattering encouragement— to apply to her father, whose negative might be uttered in such a manner as to be decisive, and whose behavior at least could not be mistaken for the affection and coquetry of an elegant female. Chapter 20 I remember Mr. Collins has just been rejected by Lizzie in the last one, in the last chapter. Mr. Collins was not left long to the silent contemplation of his successful love. For Mrs. Bennet, having dawdled about in the vestibule to watch for the end of the conference, no sooner saw Elizabeth open the door and with a quick step pass her towards the staircase than she entered the breakfast room and congratulated both him and herself in warm terms on the happy prospect of their near connection. Mr. Collins received and returned these felicitations with equal pleasure, and then proceeded to relate the particulars of their interview, with the result of which he trusted he had every reason to be satisfied since the refusal which his cousin had steadfastly given him would naturally flow from her bashful modesty and the genuine delicacy of her character. This information, however, startled Mrs. Bennet. She would have been glad to be equally satisfied that her daughter had meant to encourage him by protesting against his proposals, but she dared not believe it and could not help saying so. But depend upon it, Mr. Collins, she added, that Lizzie shall be brought to reason. I will speak to her about it directly. She is a very headstrong, foolish girl and does not know her own interest, but I will make her know it. "'Pardon me for interrupting you, madam,' cried Mr. Collins, "'but if she's really headstrong and foolish, "'I know not whether she would altogether be a desirable wife "'to a man in my situation "'who naturally looks for happiness in the marriage state. "'If therefore she actually persists in rejecting my suit, "'perhaps it were better not to force her into accepting me.' 
because if liable to such defects of temper, she could not contribute much to my felicity. Sir, you quite misunderstand me, said Mrs. Bennet, alarmed. Lizzie is not only headstrong in such matters as these. In everything else, she is as good-natured a girl as ever lived. I'll go directly to Mr. Bennet, and we shall very soon settle it with her, I am sure. She would not give him time to reply, but hurrying instantly to her husband, called out as she entered the library, Oh, Mr. Bennet, you're wanted immediately. We're all in an uproar. You must come and make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins, for she vows she will not have him, and if you do not make haste, he will change his mind and not have her. Mr. Bennet raised his eyes from his book as she entered and fixed them on her face with a calm unconcern which was not in the least altered by her communication. "'I have not the pleasure of understanding you,' said he, when she had finished her speech. "'Of what are you talking?' "'Of Mr. Collins and Lizzie. Lizzie declares she will not have Mr. Collins, and Mr. Collins begins to say that he will not have Lizzie.' "'And what am I to do on the situation?' It seems a hopeless business. Speak to Lizzie about it yourself. Tell her you insist upon her marrying him. Let her be called down. She shall hear my opinion. Mrs. Bennet rang the bell, and Miss Elizabeth was summoned to the library. Come here, child, cried her father as she appeared. I've sent for you on an affair of importance. I understand Mr. Collins has made you an offer of marriage. Is that true? Elizabeth replied that it was. Very well. And this offer of marriage you've refused? I have, sir. Very well. We now come to the point. Your mother insists upon you accepting it. Is it not so, Mr. Bennett? Yes, or I will never see her again. An unhappy alternative is set before you, Elizabeth. From this day, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And I will never see you again if you do. Elizabeth could not but smile at such a conclusion of such a beginning. But Mrs. Bennet, who had persuaded herself that her husband regarded the affair as she wished, was excessively disappointed. What do you mean, Mr. Bennet, by talking this way? You promised me to insist upon her marrying him. My dear, replied her husband, I have two small favors to request. First is that you'll allow me the free use of my understanding on the present occasion, and secondly of my room. I should be glad to have the library to myself as soon as may be. Not yet, however, in spite of her disappointment in her husband, did Mrs. Bennet give up the point. She talked to Elizabeth again and again, coaxed and threatened her by turns. She endeavored to secure Jane in her interest, but Jane, with all possible mildness, declined interfering, and Elizabeth, sometimes with real earnestness and sometimes with playful gaiety, replied to her attacks. Though her manner was varied, however, her determination never did. Mr. Collins, meanwhile, was meditating in solitude on what had passed. He thought too well of himself to comprehend on what motives his cousin could refuse him, and though his pride was hurt, he suffered in no other way. His regard for her was quite imaginary, and the possibility of her deserving her mother's reproach prevented his feeling any regret. While the family were in this confusion, Charlotte Lucas came to spend the day with them. She was met in the vestibule by Lydia, who, flying to her, cried in a half-whisper, I'm glad you're come, for there's such fun here. What do you think has happened this morning? Mr. Collins has made an offer to Lizzie, and she will not have him. Charlotte hardly had time to answer before they were joined by Kitty, who came to tell the same news, and no sooner had they entered the breakfast room where Mrs. Bennet was alone than she likewise began on the subject, calling on Miss Lucas for her compassion and entreating her to persuade her friend Lizzie to comply with the wishes of all her family. "'Pray, my dear Miss Lucas,' she added in a melancholy tone, "'for nobody is on my side. Nobody takes part with me. I am cruelly used. Nobody feels for my poor nerves.' Charlotte's reply was spared by the entrance of Jane and Elizabeth. Ah, there she comes, 
continued Mrs. Bennet, looking as unconcerned as may be, and caring no more for us than if we were at York, provided she can have it her own way. But I tell you, Miss Lizzie, if you take it into your head to go on refusing every offer of marriage in this way, you'll never get a husband at all, and I'm sure I do not know who is to maintain you when your father has died. I shall not be able to keep you, and so I warn you. I am done with you from this very day. I told you in the library, you know, that I should never speak to you again, and you'll find me as good as my word. I have no pleasure in talking to undutiful children. Not that I have much pleasure indeed in talking to anybody. <laughs> so, people who suffer as I do from nervous complaints can have no great inclination for talking. Nobody can tell what I suffer, but it's always so. Those who don't complain are never pitied. Her daughters listened in silence to this effusion, sensible that any attempt to reason with her or soothe her would only increase the irritation. She talked on, therefore, without interruption from any of them till they were joined by Mr. Collins, who entered the room with an air more stately than usual, and on perceiving whom, said to the girls, Now, I do insist upon it that you, all of you, hold your tongues and let me and Mr. Collins have a little conversation together. Elizabeth passed quietly out of the room. Jane and Kitty followed, but Lydia stood her ground, determined to hear all she could, and Charlotte, detained first by the civility of Mr. Collins, whose inquiries after herself and all her family were very minute, and then by a little curiosity, satisfied herself with walking to the window and pretending not to hear. In a doleful voice, Mrs. Bennet began the projected conversation. Oh, Mr. Collins, my dear madam, he replied. Let us be forever silent on this point. Far be it from me, he presently continued, in a voice that marked his displeasure, to resent the behavior of your daughter. Resignation to inevitable evils is the evil duty of us all. The particular duty of a young man has been so fortunate as I have been in early preferment, and I trust I'm resigned perhaps not the less so from feeling a doubt of my positive happiness had my fair cousin honored me with her hand. For I had been often observed that resignation is never so perfect as when the blessing denied begins to lose somewhat of its value in our estimation. You will not, I hope, consider me as showing any disrespect to your family, my dear madam, by thus withdrawing my pretensions to your daughter's favor." without having paid yourself and Mr. Bennett the compliment of requesting you to interpose your authority on my behalf. My conduct may, I fear, be objectionable in having accepted my dismission from your daughter's lips instead of your own, but we are all liable to err. I have certainly meant well through the whole affair. My object has been to secure an amiable companion for myself with due consideration for the advantage of all your family. And if my manner has been at all reprehensible, I here beg leave to apologize. 